tonight um, is, is it really for you to provide information. We don't have the rest of the building open. It's truly an informational night, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So what's tonight's objective? So I, I was an English teacher in the classroom. I taught um, for 12 years in the classroom, and you always have to have an objective for every lesson. So the objective for tonight is, is primarily for our parents and guardians, but also for students. We want you to gain the information that will help you to make the decision as to whether or not attending Eastland Fairfield or one of our satellites is the right decision for you. We understand that this is a big decision. Um, students, I wanna say how proud I am of you for saying I would like to consider going to the Career Center. It's a big step to leave your home high school and to venture out and to do something new, but that's what, um, that's what makes world, the life great, is, is trying new things and, and taking a risk. And so we want you to leave tonight with information that you can talk about, think about, maybe follow up with one of our administrators if you say I wanna have a little bit more information there so that you can can make a well-informed decision. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what guides our work. What, one of the things about coming to Eastland Fairfield is if you don't already have a child who's been here or you are not a graduate, you may say, okay, I don't really know that much about it. You know what your home school is like. You know what, what drives uh, Gehanna or Bloom Carroll perhaps, but what drives us? And I want to make sure that's clear because it truly, the things I'm going to talk about are truly those things that help us to make decisions on a daily basis. First and foremost, um, in the spring of 2021, uh, we embarked upon a strategic planning process. We updated our vision, our mission, our values, and we created a strate strategic plan with the input of all of our stakeholders, students, parents and guardians, staff, associate school members, alumni, business partners, um, and, and our Board of Education. And so we take these um, guiding principles very seriously because other people said, this is what we believe you should be doing. So our vision is to prepare and guide each student to pursue success through exceptional educational experiences. Vision, a vision statement is aspirational. It's something we aspire to do. We want every student to be able to pursue success that is of their choosing. What is it that they want to do next? And that's what we strive to do. Our mission, this is what guides our everyday work. Our mission is to engage, enrich, and equip students every day in every experience. That's not just in the labs, not just in the academic classrooms, but in the cafeteria, in the career tech student organizations, in the hallways, when they're having field day, when there's a prom or a homecoming or, or a town hall meeting, we want every single thing that we do, every experience to engage your student, to make them want to be here. We want it to enrich them, help them to become a better person. And we also want it to equip them for what is next for them. So we take that very seriously. And the administrators in the room know almost every meeting that we have is structured around this. How are we doing this? This. And we'll question, how is that engaging? Is that very engaging for students? If not, we need to rethink it. So that's very important. And then our values. Again, these are the things that guide us on a daily basis. Relationships is first. Everything that we do, every, every endeavor in which we are successful as human beings is built upon relationships. We have to build relationships, and we want to build relationships with you, our parents and guardians, and also with our students. We care about our students, we are investing in our students, and those relationships are important, but also relationships with business partners, relationships with our home schools. We've made this a significant portion of our work, and I'll come back to that. Second is innovation. We're a career center. We are charged with providing training and education in fields that are in demand by both business and industry and by our students. So we have to be innovative. We have to be willing to change regularly. And we do that. We don't change for the sake of change, but we believe that when, when the world changes, we have to change. We've all, we've all been hearing recently about artificial intelligence and how that's going to change our world. We're paying very close attention to that because we may have to innovate, or we will have to innovate to address that. Passion for learning. We're educators. We love to learn. I tell people I would go to school all the time if I could. My husband has said, no more school. You're done. No more school. But 
whether we are going formal school or informal, we have a passion for learning. We want our students to have that same passion, and we as a staff, um, a community of, of adults who support our students, also have that same passion for learning. And then finally, accountability. And again, I say this all the time, I'm a big accountability person. We need to be accountable to you, the parents and guardians of our students, to do to prepare them for the, for the work that we said we would prepare them for. We need to be accountable for building relationships with them. All of us in this room, all of the adults, we're all taxpayers. We are tax supported just like your local school district. And, and Shelly will talk more about that. We need to be accountable with how we spend money to ensure that we're spending your money ethically, wisely, and responsibly. We're accountable for how we behave with each other. And, and I'm big on, if we hold ourselves accountable, somebody else doesn't have to, but if we have to, we will do that. And so accountability is a big part of how we function because we can't say, we're going to teach your child how to um, work in the HVAC industry and then not do that well. We have to do what we said we would do because it's the right thing to do and it's why your students choose to come here. The next component of, of our work that guides our decision making is around our strategic plan that I talked about. Our strategic plan, I won't go into the, to the details, if you want them, they're on our website. But we um, organized our plan around four pillars, four things that we strive to, to do. The first pillar is to enhance climate and culture. We serve 16 different school districts. We have so many different types of students who come here and we want this to be a place where every single student feels welcomed, feels valued, feels appreciated, and knows that they can succeed. Our second pillar is ensuring programming and operational excellence. I talked about accountability to you as taxpayers. Part of operational excellence is that we're efficient with our spending, we take good care of our facilities, and, and we save money operationally where we can so we can put it into the education of our students. But programming excellence, again, we want to offer those things that are of interest and in demand for our students, and so we strive to do that. Our third pillar is fostering communications and relationships. I talked about relationships. They're so important that it is a fourth of our strategic plan and also, if you were to look in the details, there are more objectives and more action steps under building relationships and communication than any other part of our plan because it is the most important thing that we do. And finally, maximizing instructional effectiveness. We want our instructors to use practices and strategies that engage, enrich, and equip and that are effective at helping students to learn, both in labs and our academic classrooms. So, we, I talked, uh, I said about finding your E. We really started talking about this a, a few years ago, and sometimes I think, and this may be more for the students in the room, sometimes I think you're made to think that life is this, this trajectory and you just keep making one decision, it's success, success, success. And if you look at the parents and guardians, we can tell you life is a little bit more like this. It doesn't go in a smooth line. And so we don't want to talk to students about what do you want to do forever, but what do you want to do next? What comes after high school? So is it employment? Do you want to go straight into business and industry and work? We have a, a number of students who do that. The other day, um, State Superintendent Stephanie Siddons was here, and we had a student in HVAC who was talking to her. He had the company truck, van, and he was leaving from there to go do Mr. McGregor, I don't know how many calls. But, but his goal when he graduates is to work full time. That's what he wants to do. Education. Some of our students want to go on to additional education. Some of our programs are designed really for additional education. So some students, that might be coming to one of our adult education programs. We have a number of adult programs. Um, it might be going to a two-year school. It might be going to a four-year school. But some of our students know, I want to get some additional education. Enlistment. About three to four percent of our students enlist every year in the armed forces. Nationally, less than one percent of people join the military. And so we have a very high percentage of students who, who choose to enlist in the military and take their skills into the military. Or maybe it's entrepreneurship. Not every program lends itself to that, and oftentimes that maybe is something that comes later, but we have students who are saying, we want to be entrepreneurs. I want to own my own business. And in fact, under Ms. Grove's uh, leadership, we're um, adding some math classes that are specifically around how might you make that happen if that's a goal for you. So again, some of our students will do all four of these things. Some will do two, some will do three. 
the, the goal here is what is next, not what is forever, but what is next. They're too young to make the decision about what is forever, and I am toward the end of my professional career, and I still feel like it's hard to make decisions about what is next, because you don't know what's going to come along. I talked about the world changing. So, I'm gonna ask Ms. Groves to come, and she's gonna talk a little bit about how we are an extension of your child's homeschool. So welcome, good evening, are you excited? Oh, I, okay, this path is a little excited. I've got some excited people. Okay, well, welcome. This evening, uh, I realize we didn't have enough chairs set out. It's kind of like throwing a birthday party and you just hope somebody show up, somebody show up. Well, thank you so much for being here this evening. We are excited for the opportunity to work with you and your student for the 23-24 school year. So as Dr. Miller said, we are an extension of your home school. So for example, I am from Burn Union. If I were still enrolled, and yes, I, I have students enrolled, I myself am not enrolled at Burn Union right now, but if I were and I'm attending Eastland Fairfield, I would still be a Burn Union student. You are not losing your enrollment at your associate school. How about graduation? Where will I graduate from? You will be graduating from your associate school. You'll be a graduate of Reynoldsburg, of Whitehall. You will walk in their ceremony. You are still a member of your associate school. What campus does my student attend? If I have any students in here, how many students are gonna be attending Fairfield? Do you know already? Awesome, okay. How many students are going to be attending Eastland? Raise your hand if you know already. Okay, and that's okay because we have Thursday night, hopefully, for the rest of those Eastland folks. But the program you enroll in or that you've applied to be a part of doesn't matter where you live in our planning district as part of those 16 schools that feed into us. Doesn't matter where you live. It is program specific what campus you're going to be attending. For example, if I, let's go Burn Union again. If I'm a Burn Union student and I want collision repair, the only campus we have collision repair is at Eastland. If I am a Whitehall student and I want animal management, I'm gonna be attending here at Fairfield for animal management. So you attend the campus where the program is located. We do have a little bit of overlap, cosmetology, because we have so many students applying for cosmetology, automotive tech, um, as well as, as, well as um, criminal justice. We do have some overlapping in Eastland Fairfield, and I believe on the application you could give your preference, but again, that comes down to our application process. What if my students wants to, wants to play sport? We encourage all of our students to be active participants at their associate schools. We want you, we want you to stay active. We want you to stay connected. I know my personal children, I have band kids. They still, when my daughter attended, I still wanna be a part of the band back at your home school and you definitely, we encourage you, we want you to participate because you're still part of that community, okay? How does my student get to Eastland Fairfield? Well, number one, they can drive, okay? First choice is you can drive. Second choice, there is transportation. Transportation is provided by your associate district. So if I'm a Reynoldsburg student, Reynoldsburg will be providing transportation to Eastland or Fairfield. If you are a satellite student, you will have to drive to that satellite location. Eastland or Fairfield transportation is provided by your home district. So if there's an issue with your pickup or drop off of your student, you will want to contact the transportation department for your associate school, okay? What calendar should we follow? I would personally love it if I got two spring breaks. But unfortunately, we can't allow that to happen. When you attend Eastland Fairfield, you will follow the Eastland Fairfield calendar, the school calendar for Eastland Fairfield. You, I'm sorry, I wish I could give it to you. You cannot have two spring breaks. You can't extend your winter vacation if there's a couple of days difference. You follow the Eastland Fairfield calendar, okay? So that leads us to the last question. What about calamity days? 
Oh, Dr. Miller, I love this question. So we serve, I'll give you a little history lesson about Eastland Fairfoot. We serve 16 districts. We start at Bexley and come all the way around 270, Gahanna, Whitehall, Pickerington, Reynoldsburg, all of that, over to Groveport, Hamilton, and all of Fairfield County with the exception of Lancaster City. 700 square miles, that's pretty big. So imagine yourself, it's a beautiful mid-January day. There is snow in southern Ohio below 270. Above 270, the sun is shining, but it's chilly. Our district philosophy, if eight, if half of our districts close, we will close. But if eight, are open. For eight, if eight are open, I said it backwards, we're gonna say it the reverse of it. If eight are open, we are open. We're not gonna go the negative of that. If eight are open, we will remain open. But what I need you to realize, it may be sunshiny in your district, but it could be hideous down south in a southern district or vice versa. So we really want our students to be safe. We want to make sure that they're young drivers. So we want to make sure that they are safe on their way to school. If, and I, I will read this verbatim here, okay? If at least eight districts are open, we are open. We will not have, you will not have district transportation if your home school is closed. Okay, if your home district says we're closing due to the weather, they will not be providing transportation. With that being said, if your student is absent or tardy because the home school is closed, they will be excused. It's okay, we understand it's weather. If the district is open and we are open, the expectation is that the student will be here to attend classes. Okay, I know that was a lot of information, your heads are probably spinning right now, and we're going to give you a little bit more. If I could have, yes, come on up, Assistant Principal Dakia Washington, and she's going to talk a little bit about what life is like here at the Career Center. Thank you. So good evening and welcome. I see a lot of familiar faces either from Groveport, I'm a Groveport graduate or Reynoldsburg, so welcome. As Dr. Miller stated, I'm one of the assistant principals here at Fairfield Career Center, so I know you guys are wondering about our daily schedule here, so our schedule is a little different than some home schools. I know some home schools operate on a block schedule, but because we have lab here, our juniors actually start in lab for approximately the first four periods of the day while seniors are in academics. So we do offer academics, we offer for our social studies courses, our math courses, science, as well as English courses. So your home school will tell you what you need to take your junior and senior year. You'll do some scheduling through them. But we also have our school counselors here that will talk you through the process, make sure your credits are where they need to be. And if, they, if you are credit deficient, we have some intervention programs or remediation to make sure that you are where you need to be for graduation. So as far as our schedule, seniors are reversed. Seniors have lab in the afternoon, academics in the, sorry, lab in the afternoon, academics in the morning. So again, um, they start first start of their day. We start about 8.05, they're in classes, they're in their academics, and then in the afternoon, they'll be in their labs. So any questions you have about that, again, the administrators here will be around and you can ask questions about that. It's a bit different. Our class periods run from about 40 minutes to 50 minutes. So um, a bit of an adjustment to some block scheduling, but students like to go to their classes. They like to be in their labs, enjoy their trays. So it's really a fun environment to be involved with. Um, Again, the types of academics and courses we offer are the same as your home school. Some students do choose to do academics at their home school, but most students are here for academics. So our hallway here are all academic hallways. They're kind of intertwined with the labs, but they are very separate, look a lot different. They look like normal classrooms here. So when you guys come back to do the tours, make sure you look at the academics. We'll show you guys where the different hallways are. It is a big building, so we work with you to make sure you get adjusted. Um, appropriately. So scheduling, again, you should be starting to have those conversations as sophomores for scheduling for your junior year. Um, if you do decide to, you know, stay at your home school, you can do your academics there and then just come for lab in the morning and head out for academics in the afternoon. 
We did begin a one-to-one -one Chromebook program this year where each student gets their own Chromebook. You are responsible for taking great care of it. I have lots of, uh, well, I accidentally bent it and it got cracked coming to the office, but we do repair those, get you back running pretty quickly, but you'll have your own Chromebook and as long as you complete the program successfully, you actually get to keep it. So that's a great benefit that we worked hard to get. And so every student has one-to-one. -one. I know a lot of homeschools have been doing this for quite some time, but we're excited we're able to offer that and we do have our IT here, uh, Mr. Saunders, who is actually a graduate from here. Um, so he stays on top of keeping your Chromebook working, functional, and making sure you can do all your academics inside of school and outside as well. And then does your student have to wear a uniform? So this is a big, big topic. Um, yes, we do have uniforms for lab, and I see some of my current students here in uniform. So we take pride in our uniforms, but we have started to offer like a spirit pack where students can get hoodies, t-shirts, and wear our Eastland Fairfield logos as well. We're very proud of our brand and who we are. So we do offer t-shirts, but the lab teachers are, it's their discretion to what you can wear during lab. And some is for safety so start to look at those uniforms and if you need certain shoes to make sure you know your feet are safe or headgear we want to make sure you guys are safe a lot of our labs there's lots of dangerous equipment lots of heavy equipment so also cosmetology sharp items so we really want to keep you safe as well as also let you be a high schooler and look cool sometimes too we do do dress down days randomly not often but randomly and we try to have school spirit so we have you represent your homeschool some again I'm a Groveport graduate, so sometimes I wear Groveport gear with you guys or college gear, you know, future gear of where you may um, go for college. So we do have some fun times and fun gear, but overall we definitely have a uniform policy and you guys will start to try those on, see your uniform, but we also have some of the gear that's more so geared to hoodies and teenage life. Um, we will answer more questions about that, but that's overall um, just some of the things that are a little different from homeschools, but also some similarities. So next I'm gonna introduce my counterpart, um, Assistant Principal, Mr. Bo Stidham. All right, good evening, everyone. I have the privilege of, uh, I get to talk about food, all right, which is uh, a great thing, and everybody wants to know the answer to that. Uh, so uh, we are a part of both schools within the district. We are a part of the National School Lunch Program. Um, that's a federal program uh, that assists uh, schools for lunches. So I invite you, uh, when you have some time as you're researching about more about the Career Center in the upcoming days, please visit our district website, eastlandfairfield.com. If you click on the high school drop down, and then Food Services is a page dedicated to all about that National School Lunch Program. And it tells you uh, how to access um, a free and reduced lunch application um, if you are so interested. One thing to be very clear, um, if you have experience with that free and reduced lunch application in the past at your associate schools, uh, you do have to resubmit that here within our district. So uh, once again, that website walks you through how to do that. Um, in short, we use Pace Schools um, as a way to add funds to your student's account and then the student's ID number that they are given that they are associated with, um, they will use that in the cafeteria um, for a cashless exchange, if you will, for um, those meals and you can add money to that account uh, via that Pace Schools um, account that you have created. Once again, our website walks you through how to do that. On opening days, we'll also provide tutorials and guides uh, how to create your account. Uh, so once again, I just want to reiterate, um, I know they're in the beginning days here in August, uh, you do have to submit that application through us in order to receive that, that, that benefit. Um, another key note is make sure to have a separate email account. Do not use that same email account that you would have used um, at your associate school uh, for that free reduced lunch application. Um, is the cafeteria, our food, the only way in which you can um, eat during the day? No, absolutely not. You can pack your lunch. Students are more than welcome to do that. Um, if they so choose, they're encouraged. Um, we have microwaves um, here for their access. Uh, we try to keep that abundant so they maximize their time in the cafeteria of that duration of 30 to 40 minutes that they have time to eat. Um, as well, I, I just want to make note, uh, due to 
uh, where we're located, and then also uh, safety and security. We do not uh, allow outside food uh, to be delivered here to the school, like DoorDash or Uber Eats, anything like that. Uh, we do not allow that. Um, once again, that's safety and security in today's times. So if you could, please pack your lunch um, or um, check out the meals that we have um, in our cafeteria and our cafeteria staff work extremely hard to provide those healthy options. Next, I'm gonna introduce Principal Mr. Matt McGregor. All right, again, I'm, I'm Matt McGregor. I'm the principal here. I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about uh, a few more things. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about is how am I gonna be informed about Career Center news and updates like this. There's a lot of information here. We certainly don't expect you guys to remember all this. So once you fill out your forms, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but down here when I get signed up for communications, completing your forms, you're gonna get something in the mail that's gonna to come to you with a username and a password printed out on it so that you fill out your forms, then you start, then your emails will populate with me and then I will send out information, all this information. So don't feel, this is kind of the once over the world, I know it's overwhelming, how am I gonna remember all this? I will send this information out to you. So the website is a great website. Um, there's a lot of information there. You just have to kind of click through it. You click on, like Mr. Sidham said, there's a lunch, the cafeteria information's on there, the high school information's on there, the uniform information's on there. Um, we're gonna have an app um, that, will, that will send you information on how to get that. I send out a weekly newsletter via email uh, to whatever email address you register with once you get that information in the mail. Uh, we, we also, we have social media accounts on all the, the big social media so you can follow those to get updates, um, whether it's calamity days or things that are going on in the school. We talked about the completing forms and attendance requirements. So we do have the same attendance requirements that everybody else does. Um, we have, we are under the same attendance law as your home school so if you have truancy or if there was a truancy issue we, we, we would do the, follow the same policy so if you know anybody that has gone through that you know we, we work with you there's certain threshold you have to meet um, the calamity days as uh, uh, Mrs. Groves uh, uh, talked about it we, we take we work with you a lot on excused days because we have 17 different districts you know when I came here I came from Gahanna and talking with kids from Fairfield County, I'm like, man, why were you guys closed yesterday? Like I got on Gehanna and I got on 270 and 33 and it was fine. And they're like, have you ever driven on Coon Path Road past right here or any part of Fairfield County? And I'm like, well, a little bit, you know? And they're like, no, we can't get out. Like I literally can't get out of my driveway. So that's been an education piece for us. So we certainly work with you, um, but we do have the same tennis requirements as your home school. So, all right. Student support systems, uh, Mr. Dwight Carter. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I know you guys have been sitting for a while. So just take a minute and stand up, stretch, move around, but a minute or not. Let's move on. <laughs> that was all in the interest of health and wellness. So I'm the director of student support systems. What does that actually mean? In a nutshell, um, our responsibility is to remove barriers to student success. So if there's a barrier that's in place, it can be um, climate and culture, health and wellness, intervention services, our responsibility within our department is to work with the student, work with the parents, work with the staff, school staff, to remove that barrier to make sure they're, they are successful. Our staff includes um, our coordinator of student support systems, Mrs. Ashley Miller in the background. Um, so you'll have a chance to talk to her a little bit later in the hallway. Our school counselors, Mr. Philhauer and Ms., uh, Mrs. Thompson. We have two social workers here from New Horizons, uh, Ms. Teresa Howard and Ms. Tiffany Tenapple, and our school nurse, um, Mrs. Karen McGarvey. So all those individuals, if you have questions, specific questions about those areas, as you uh, exit the building or exit the MP room, there's four tables in the hallway. They have some information on tables. You can ask questions as, as well. So when we think about um, FAPE, which is free and appropriate um, public education, we're actually talking about special education. In special education, um, if you have an IEP, you know that, or you have a 504, you know that. So what does that entail? When you think about coming to a new school, we are still responsible for implementing that IEP or that 504. Who does that? Great question. Just like your associate schools, we also have intervention specialists. Those intervention specialists will work directly with the student 
and the parents to make sure that IEP is implemented. Our instructor, instructors will get a copy of that IEP at the beginning of the year, they'll review the IEP, and they'll work with the intervention specialist to make sure all um, accommodations and modifications are, are implemented. There's additional support as well. We have a, a support uh, study hall system for that resource that's necessary. All, uh, so we have also in our academic classes, we have call what's called co-teaching classes. So that means if you're in an, an algebra or an English or science class or social studies class, and you're not, you have an IEP, more than likely you will have two teachers in that room, the academic specialist and the intervention specialist. So they'll do some different types of uh, um, activities or instructional strategies to make sure you get that additional support. Uh, when you think about um, transitioning or transferring from your associate school to East or Fairfield Career Center, Ashley, Mrs. Uh, Ms. Miller will start to have transfer meetings here in the next few weeks. So she'll meet with you as a student, parents are ab absolutely involved in that, the associate school support staff is involved, and if it's an opportunity to renew the IEP based on some changes that are necessary, that'll all happen during that transfer meeting. When that occurs, everybody will be on the same page, so when you start the school year, the, the, the interventions that you had in your associate school, you will also have with us to a degree. And I'll, I'll state that. Um, so if you need a, sp a specific aid, make sure your, your home school will provide, or associate school will provide that. Um, when you think about um, the caseload, so all of our intervention specialists have a caseload of students. So all students on an IEP, do, they do have one person who's specifically overseeing them and that can, they can contact. And parents, that will be the person you would, you would speak to the most. If you have additional questions about intervention services, there's a, there are a few people that you can contact. As I, I mentioned, you can contact Ashley Miller. You can also talk to our school counselors, and you can talk to um, our social workers as well. We have a student services department within each building, so you will start there and then state your need, and they'll, they'll direct you to the correct person. But the, the key, the one thing I want you to remember as you leave here today, the supports that you had those don't stop. Our job is to help you, as Mrs. Miller said, get to your next E. Some, need, some students need a little bit more um, accommodations and, and um, special interventions. Some need some equitable inter interventions, which is a 504. Either way, you will get what you need here to be successful. You also have to do your part. So show up, be involved, advocate for yourself, and make sure you follow and implement the things that you commit to do, okay? So my department, again, oversees pillar number one, which is a part of our strategic plan, which is enhancing our climate and culture. You've heard this probably five or six times now, so you're gonna hear it for a sixth or seventh time. We service 700 square miles, 17 high schools, 16 different districts, and I think five counties, five counties. We are diverse by design. So with that said, some of the things that we implement when we think about climate and culture, we wanna make sure that we don't just say we're inclusive, we don't wanna just say we're diverse, we wanna implement and act on that diversity. Additionally, we also want to make sure student voice is important. So we have a number of student programs that a students will be able to state what they want to see happen. We had a couple of programs here this year that were all student-led based on their interest. The reason why we do that is because you guys are taking a very adult-like decision. You're choosing to leave your associate school to come to a new school. That's a wise decision and that takes courage. And you're, you're coming together with a whole new class of, of students that you've never met before. And we're asking you in two years to build a community. That takes intentionality and effort. And we take pride in that. So to make sure we enhance our climate and culture, we need student input and student voice. We also get student um, input on a survey that we implement twice a year. Once at the beginning of the year and then once towards the end to make sure we identify what students, how students feel about our school around certain topics then we can take that data, decide what to do with it, and then we take a, follow the survey at the end of the year to see where we successful in those areas, and then we use that data also to plan for the next year. 
So again, it's very collaborative because again, we want to make sure our culture is where everybody feels there's a sense of belonging. And what that means is you feel seen, heard, validated, and treated fairly. If you have any other questions about the intervention services, again, you can see Mrs. Miller in the hallway once you leave here. Mrs. Cuffle. So this is Jackie Cuffle, our coordinator of satellite programs. Good evening. I'm so excited because I get to talk about career tech student organizations. One of the things that I'm very, very passionate about. One of the things that Dr. Miller spoke about when she first got up was our mission that we're going to um, engage, enrich, and equip our students. And one of the things that we do that through is through our career tech student organizations. And you're going, what's that? Well, many of you have probably heard of FFA back in your home schools or DECA, those are our student organizations. These are organizations that are led by the students, but you, as privileged students here, are auto, we pay for your membership in an organization. Eastland Career Tech Schools have seven different organizations. These organizations align with the have been accepted into. These organizations go around three major areas. First, leadership. These are opportunities that you can take to be a leader. Eastland Fairfield has had the privilege of having local, regional, state, and national officers throughout the country. And in fact, one of our national officers was with BPA two years ago, and she's now still a student at Ohio University in Athens. Not only do we look at leadership, we look at technical skill. Technical skill is the competition part of it. You have the opportunity to compete each year on the skills that you're learning in your program. So things that you are doing. So if you're a welder, you can compete in welding. Last year, one of our welders, a, uh, a young lady, Rowan, took second in the nation. She competed locally, regionally, at the state, went to nationals, and second in the nation. And she's a senior this year. She went second as a junior in high school. Most of our organizations, actually all of our organizations, have other charitable events that they contribute to, like Healthcare, they work um, with a, a group that does bone marrow transfers. So they raise money for people who are going through bone marrow transfers. And so that's one of those organizations. But each of our organizations do that. Plus, they get to have a little fun and have some activities. One of the things that BPA did this last year, they went to a leadership conference at um, nationwide arena with the Blue Jackets. So we got to go to a leadership conference during the day, and in the evening, we got to skate around on the rink and then sat for a Blue Jackets game. That's kind of the fun stuff you get to do. Those are the types of activities. You also have to fundraise. Just putting a plug out there for our skills and, and um, FFA here at Fairfield Center on May a bazaar here. I think it's nine to two. I could be a little bit wrong on that, but I think it's nine to two. And that bazaar is going to raise money for these activities that the students take part in. So those are all part of being a member of a organization here. These successes that we have, and you look at these pictures here, these are kids that are going to nationals this next week. Caden, who's a senior, went to nationals and took first place last year for BPA. He's working with three juniors this year. They took first place at state. They are leaving this next Tuesday, and they are going to nationals in Anaheim, California, and they will be competing in video broadcasting. 
So pretty exciting, all the different things that you can do and the successes that we have here with our um, career tech student organizations. It's a privilege to be a part of it, but it's also what you put into it because what you put into it, you will get out of it. And leadership is a huge piece that will take you with your professional skills going forward. Thank you. And now um, Mrs. Groves will speak to us. Before we get into work-based learning, a quick question. I want to revisit um, the daily structure and scheduling for students here at Eastland Fairfield. If I say CCP, or College Credit Plus, how many people know what that means? Yeah, everybody, pretty much everybody's heard about it. Um, College Credit Plus is an opportunity for students to earn college credit while they are still in high school. Almost, I believe, every high school offers College Pre Credit Plus coursework. Mainly, no, not mainly, all in academic areas, math, science, social studies, and English language arts. At Eastland Fairfield, we also have structures for students to be able to earn college credits. There's three different ways. First, College Credit Plus. That means students apply, they have to meet the requirements, they're accepted into the specific college, the content follows the curriculum, usually a semester long, the, they get a transcripted credit from that institution. Okay, so once they pass the class and once they graduate, they get a transcript that says, you earned an A in College Credit Plus Calculus through Columbus State. That goes with them wherever they go. That's one way a student can earn college credit. Career technical education, it's a little different. We have several more opportunities for students to earn college credit. The second way they can earn college credit is what are called artic bilateral articulated agreements. And I am in the process now working for our senior students to get them those credits. Basically what happens, I send out to all of our post-secondary partners, Hawking College, Columbus State, COTC, Franklin University, UNOH, um, there's lots more, I'm not gonna list them all. But I send out to them and I say, here are the courses that students in each program have completed. So for example, if you are in pre-nursing, I already know and it's sad that I know this, the courses are medical terminology, patient care, patient care and diagnostics, and mental health. Those are the four co courses that make up that program. So I send out that information to all of our partners. Our partners look at the curriculum and they say, hey, if a student takes this course, they pass the end of course assessment and they come to our institution, we will award them credit, college credit, for that course. So let me give you an example. Again, I'm a pre-nursing student. I'm enrolled, I've taken the four courses. Hawking College says, okay, we will award you college credit for patient-centered care. So now, when I apply to Hawking College, they're gonna give me college credit towards my program at Hawking College. Okay, does that make sense? CCP, it's transcripted. Bilateral articulation, they're telling you, you come here, we will give you the college credit. The third option, they're called CTAG credits. These are throughout the state of Ohio and basically it's the same thing. They're looking at the career technical courses and each post-secondary partner is saying, this course, we will give you college credit for taking and completing the course and the program. So three wonderful opportunities for students to earn college credit, not just the traditional CCP route, but also through career technical options, meaning bilateral articulated credits and CTAGs. Okay, you'll hear more, trust me, your students will hear more about that, but I just wanted to put a bug in your ear and let you know, we do have opportunities for students to earn some college credits to take with them after they graduate and complete our programs. Now, work-based learning. I will start this conversation by saying work-based learning is not for every student, okay? In fact, Probably realistically, it's only about 12 to 15 percent of our student population that will be ready to participate in work-based learning. It is very much differentiated instruction. 
That means one student may be ready for it, another student may not, and that's okay. It's not a requirement, it is a privilege for those students who are ready. What happens, students during their junior year, we take a look at grades, we take a look at attendance. If they meet the grade and attendance requirements, we allow them to go out during their senior year to actually work in the field. Another thing we've done is modified our curriculum and we've given, given students what we're calling voice and choice in their academic offerings. If a student says, I really wanna be done with all of my academics junior year, so senior year, I can go out and work all day. Now again, we're talking a very special student that would be able to do that. But what we have done is created semester courses for English, math, science, and social studies. So a student can say, I really wanna double up on some credits here, so that way I've got my English credits done, my math credits done, senior year, I'm ready to go out, and I'm, I'm gonna work, I wanna work. The other thing we do is we allow students to help us develop our curriculum in English language arts, math, social studies, and science. It has been a lot of fun. It has been a lot of fun. This is the first year we've been through the process and we have six students last year that said, I'm gonna double up on credits, my academic credits. This year, these students don't even come to school. They're reporting out onto the job site. They're getting graded by a mentor on the job site that's coming back to us and they're still getting grades for their lab but they are out all day. So some incredible opportunities. Again, remember, work-based learning is not for everyone. It is not. We all learn at different place paces, and that is okay. But those, for those students who are ready for that next level, we've got some opportunities for them. So, wanna make sure I've answered all the questions in terms of work-based learning. What is work-based learning? I think I've already defined that. Who is eligible? We look at GPA, attendance, discipline, because again, it is a privilege, it is not a right. We're not required to allow students to participate in it. How does my student sign up? Have a conversation with their lab instructor. This can't happen until the senior year, so make sure you're communicating with your lab instructor. What are the benefits? How awesome would it, does it look on a resume to say, my senior year of high school, I worked 40 hours a week. Pretty awesome. Getting your foot in the door in a field that you love and that you've studied is a great step in the, in the right direction. And is it required? It is not. It is a privilege. It is not a right. With that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Miller, who is gonna talk a little bit more specifically about what does it mean to be in a workforce development program. So there are a lot of benefits to being um, a superintendent. One of them is you get to talk about all the legal issues with folks, <laughs> okay? Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some components of education at a career center that may be different for a portion of the educational time when you're here. So this doesn't apply necessarily to everybody. But we talked, uh, Dwight talked a little bit about having an IEP or a 504. This question comes up for us every year. So I wanna make sure you understand what's the difference between an IEP, an ed Individualized Education Plan, or a 504, and what's called an ADA accommodation, okay? So first thing, IEP Section 504. That is governed under the federal law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. The term education is really, really important. This, is, this protects the rights of students in the K-12 setting. So traditional school, really, if the child has a disability at age of three and goes to school, it can go from age three, it actually goes from age three to age 22. Okay, because a student can be in a K-12 setting who has a disability from age three to age 22. So IDEA covers students in the thir three to 22. It's an educational support. Dwight talked about working with the home schools. If a student has a disability, they are guaranteed under federal law a right to a free and appropriate public education. Okay, FAPE, so if you live in this world, you've probably heard these terms. 
It's mandated by the federal government and the district must offer it. We are an extension of the district. Now, it, in real technical terms, the home district is responsible for FAPE. But when the student chooses to come here, we work together on that, okay? So when it says it's, it's mandated, the district has to offer. There's something called child find in the federal law. School districts are required to find those students in their attendance zone who have a disability and then offer them services either under Section 504 or under an IEP. The district is accountable for finding those students. Now, it's very helpful when parents come forward or guardians and give us that information, but regardless, the district is responsible. And the district is responsible for offering the services, okay? A family can refuse the services. You certainly have that right. But the district is the accountable party. Let's move over to Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA. It protects the rights of adults with disabilities. Once a student leaves, or, 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 or you can develop a disability, once you're no longer in a K-12, 3 to 22 in school setting, this now applies. Accommodates, uh, the accommodations cannot interfere with the, quote, essential functions of the job. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But basically, employers must comply with the ADA law so long as what the, what's being provided doesn't interfere with their ability to do the primary job. I'm gonna give you two really simple examples. I have a job and I am a cashier or I'm working in a job where I'm pretty much in the same place all day and typically it's a job that you're standing. But I have a disability that requires me to be able to, to sit for part of the time. I go to my employer and I say, can I have a stool or a chair so that I can sit at during, my t during the time? As long as I can continue to do, quote, the essential functions of the job, then the employer is obligated to provide me with that stool or that chair so I can sit down. I can still do the job, I just need to sit, even though that's not typically how it's done. Let's take another example. I work at the airport. I've been hired to handle baggage. And I have a disability that says I can only, or I have a physical disability and I can only lift 10 pounds. So I say to my employer, I can only lift bags that are 10 pounds or less. Does the employer have to provide that accommodation? No. An essential function of being a baggage handler is I'm handling the bags, not just the little ones. I have to be able to do all of them. Now, we're not going to get into real legal stuff where do they have to offer you something different, okay? But does that make sense? ADA is you get the accommodation, but you still have to do the essential function. The other thing, it says voluntary. It doesn't mean it's voluntary for companies to abide by it, but the, the employee has to ask for it. If the employee doesn't ask for it, the, the employer is not under any obligation to, to know. Unlike a school district, we have to know. We have to find the students. Employers don't have to go out and say, does anybody have a, need an accommodation? Does that make sense? So why is this important? It's important because we have, in a career center, we are, yes, career exploration, but we are workforce development. The programs that are offered here are technically adult education programs. Ohio is very unique. We are one of the only states in the country that has career centers. We are one of the only states in the country where students have the opportunity to explore and learn and grow in these types of programs, and they are adult-centered programs, okay? So the question that often comes to us does my child's IEP or 504 apply outside the career center? The answer is no. That means even though they're in high school, if they're going out on work-based learning, which Shelly just talked about, clinical rotations, and we'll talk more um, about that later, observations in a work setting, internships, job shadowing, any time a student leaves the career center and goes into the world of work, the IEP stops. Think of it, it stops at the doors of the schoolhouse. It does not apply outside of school. Even though you may say, but my child's still in high school, so why does, it doesn't matter. The employer is not obligated to follow the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. K-12, 
can my student have an ADA accommodation when learning outside the career center? Yes, so long as they can still perform the essential functions of the role, okay? So, we'll talk more about this. Some of our programs are such that you have to be able to respond very quickly. If you, if you have an IEP that says every 45 minutes you get to have a 15 minute break, some fields would be very difficult for you to work in. And the employer doesn't have to make the accommodation. And I have to tell you, they won't. There are no exceptions to this. And this is one of those really important things you need to be, if this applies to you and your student, you need to really think about what does this mean. Oftentimes, even parents say, well, if my child goes to college, they still get the IEP. Not exactly. They can go to the Office of Student Services. They have to go on their own. The university is not required to do it. Parents can't do it for them. They have to go to the office. They have to provide evidence of what accommodation, and they have to go there to get it. Nobody comes finding them in their lecture hall and gives them what they need. Versus in school, we have to go do it. This is really important, as I said, if work-based learning or you're in a program where part of the learning has to take place in industry, then this becomes an issue, okay? I'm gonna show you something to make my point when I talk about this is real. When I first came here, and I spent my first 31 years in K-12 uh, school districts, I was superintendent of a, of a traditional K-12 district here in Columbus before here. Career exploration is part of it, and it's great because you're not going to spend $25,000 at a university for a year figuring out if you like pre-nursing or if you like nursing or if you like engineering. This is, it's relatively a free, it's not free parents because we pay taxes, but it's a relatively free way to explore. But it is still workforce exploration and it's real. And that's why that IEP or 504, some of the things that we can do in a school setting cannot be done outside of school. So I'm gonna show you. This took place on Friday. These are high school seniors in our firefighting program. That's a real fire. I was there, it was hot. I was standing about 25 yards back. They literally are right on top of that car. This, this, is, this is real workforce development. When I came here, I used to say, we give kids hot, heavy, sharp objects. Students, we give you hot, heavy, sharp objects. And that's why this is such a, an important decision because it's, it's a very adult decision. But parents, guardians, what I need you to understand is if you have a 504, an IEP for your student, understand how that plays when they leave the career, career center. Much like if your child has an IEP or 504 and they have a job working at McDonald's or Target or some, that, those industries do not, they don't take the IEP. And these students are juniors and seniors. We're getting them ready to leave into the world where that IEP doesn't go. One of our jobs is to make them as independent as possible so that they can manage through things on their own without those supports. We know that's not always possible, but that can impact careers. And so it's something for you to think of. We want every single person here who's listening to this, we want, what's next? Well, work with your student to determine, is this the right choice? Is coming to the Career Center the right choice? We hope 100% of you will say, yes, I want to go, because there are some awesome, awesome things that happen. And I will tell you, <clears throat> the firefighters, they were having a blast. I mean, they were excited and they were nervous, but they were having a great time because they've worked all year to learn to do that. And it was pretty incredible and amazing to be there. And it was fun when they were finished. They were high-fiving and everything, and it was not all boys. Okay, so uh, it's a great opportunity. So, um, but if the answer after you think about it and talk about it is, I don't think this is right, or maybe not my junior year, um, please notify Career Services so that we can connect the next student on the list. Some of our programs, there's a waiting list. So if you decide this isn't for me, that's okay, but we want to make sure we give the next student on the list the opportunity to say, yes, it is for me and I wanna come. So if you can make that decision, um, and that would be great. If the answer is yes, and we hope it is, we want you to complete the online enrollment information. Mr. Fisher, Toby, when will that be available? You will get a piece of paper in the mail that will have your login information, because they needed to log in a long time ago. Um, and it will have directions to complete the form. Those will come out in the mail sometime in the next two weeks. Probably sooner, but it will give us two weeks. Okay. 
Awesome, so be watching for that. So complete those forms. Please, please, please complete them in their entirety. Shelly talked about we're an extension of the high school, but Bo also mentioned, but our we 16 districts, we don't all use the same systems. And so things do not automatically transfer. Some things we get from your home district, some things we need you to do. You are enrolled, remember, in your home school, but you have to enroll here as well. It's not an automatic. So please complete the forms. Um, attend New Student Celebration on May 9th at 6.30. You go to the campus where your program is. You go to where you're gonna be attending. Um, that's gonna be a really fun night. I know our, our, cam our uh, campus uh, administrators are working and our staff are working on that. Staff will all be here that night as well, so you get a chance to meet English teachers, math teachers, um, English teachers. Shelly was a math teacher, I was an English teacher. So um, lab instructors, so you'll get the chance to really spend some time. So make sure you're here for that. It's a lot of fun. Um, watch your email throughout the summer for important updates. Attend back to school night on August 11th. Parents, guardians, that's for you too. We invite you all to come in. That's from 4.30 to 7, or 4 to 7.30. So it's a nice long window. So whatever works in your schedule, you can come in and out. Um, and then just get ready for an amazing experience. The things that our students do blow me away. Again, this is my 34th year in public education. And the things that I see our students do are just incredible. Um, and I wanna tell you, I was here last week, again, Dr. Siddons was here, and I was walking around with some students, and one of the students, she was talking to me about how much she loves it here. She's in pre-nursing, and she was talking about how much she loves it here. And I said, what is it you love? She said, everybody here is new, and so it's, we all just make friends because we're, we're all came new. She's a junior. And she said, we're all just really trying to focus on our futures and get ahead. And everybody's really supportive of one another. And I thought, you, that's, that's it. That's what you want school to be. Um, and so I know every student doesn't have exactly the same experience, but this really is an incredible place to grow and learn. Um, and to really be ready for what's next. Again, whether it's work or if you wanna to go to college, I often say our students who choose to go to four-year schools, actually, um, where there's some data that shows career center students actually have a higher graduation rate. Only about 40% of people who go to college graduate, but career center students have a higher graduation rate, and I think it's because they're aware of what they're going into. They've prepared for it. So it's a great opportunity, um, and we know that you would enjoy it. So last thing, if you are here and you are looking at pre-nursing or pre-dental, we would invite you to come, come up toward the front here. There are some different and specific program information that you need to be aware of if you are thinking about one of those two fields. Uh, Ms. Groves and, and Mr. Siddham are gonna talk about um, what, what uh, pre-dental and pre-nursing, some additional upper, or expectations that come with those, again, in the vein of you're working in the real world in a real setting with real patients. So I will turn that over. For everyone else, are, are, there, are there any just general questions that anybody would like to ask? It's a lot of information. Feel free to contact if you're, if you're gonna be coming to this campus, Mr. McGregor, Mr. Stidham, Ms. Washington, Ms. Miller, who I think is out in the hallway already. Um, if you know you're looking at Eastland, you can contact Mr. Gates, uh, Mr. Harris, uh, Ms. Griffin, or Ms. Huey there. Um, if, you're, if you're stuck and you don't know who to call, call central office, ask to speak to Jen Matchett, she's our administrative assistant, she'll get you connected to whomever you need. Okay? Thank you so much for coming. Have a great evening. And again, if you need some information, it's out in the lobby.